Welcome to the Follow the Leaders podcast, where we get a glimpse into the minds and lives of exceptional leaders and hear about their experiences, insights, and strategies for success. On today's episode, we'll hear from one heart-centered, effective leader and hear about their wisdom and perspective. So get ready to follow along. Welcome back to the show. I first want to give a big thank you to our listeners. We have gotten such warm responses to our episodes recently, and that has been so great to hear. We are excited to keep getting the word out about the podcast so we can share about the work that our guests are doing and keep bringing you this helpful content. So if you haven't already left the podcast a rating or a review, I would love it if you could take a few moments now to give us a five-star rating or leave a review as that is one of the very best ways for you to support the pod. All right. I am excited to talk with my guest today. I am joined by Zach Brandon for this conversation. As a business owner myself and a huge Madison fan, I am particularly intrigued by the work he and his organization are doing. Zach Brandon is the president of the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce and has served in that role since November of 2012. There he leads his team in working to increase opportunity, enhance connectivity, strengthen community resilience, and enable responsible governance. Prior to joining the Greater Madison Chamber, Zach was the director of the Wisconsin Angel Network, an early stage investment organization focused on increasing equity investments in Wisconsin's entrepreneurs, and he also served as the vice chair of public policy for the National Angel Capital Association. Previously, Zach served as deputy secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Commerce and served in the agency's senior policy and external affairs role. Zach advised the governor, commerce secretary, and the legislature on global trade and business development strategies with a heavy emphasis on expansion, investment, and entrepreneurial development. Zach has been on the leadership team of three startups, including serving as president and chief operating officer of Laundry 101 for eight years. Zach earned a BA in political science with a concentration in management from Kent State University. Congratulations, Zach, on all of your impact and your success, and welcome to the podcast. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Happy to be here with you. So you are the president of the Chamber of Commerce here in Madison. Can you share with listeners a snapshot of what that work looks like? Yeah. So, you know, if you've seen one chamber, you've seen one chamber. So I think a lot of times people misunderstand what chambers are, or they think they have a preconceived notion of what they are. We're a regional chamber, which makes us very different than a local chamber. So we are not defined by political boundaries. So we don't stop and start at Madison's municipal boundaries, which is why you see the word greater Madison in there. And so we follow the economic line. So we really follow companies. And so if you are a company that is based here, you're, you recruit from here, your, your talent is largely located here. You fly out of here, you entertain here, or if you're in Europe and someone said, where are you? You would use the generic descriptor of Madison. You're in greater Madison. So think for us today, we have our members range from Dodgeville to Waterloo to Baraboo to Janesville and then everything in between with the largest concentration being in Dane County. We have more than 1,200 members, so we're a large chamber of commerce. Our work revolves around four core categories. It is brand. So who's developing the brand for the region, particularly the business brand, who's telling the story far from this place. So when you see a a headline that says the new Mecca for millennials or Gen Z's moving to Madison in numbers that aren't seen anywhere else in the United States, chances are we're pushing that narrative. We're pushing that story with the hope that a content creator is picking up on it. And then we then reamplify that message and say, look, Bloomberg says, you know, or Business Insider <laughs> says, or nice. Inc. says, but we're generally the ones pushing that narrative. We also did, and we can get into this later if you're interested in it, but we also did a, a national perception study to understand what people think of Madison beyond the Wisconsin borders. And so we have been turning Madison's brand away from our traditional brand positioning into a new space that we think is more conducive and um, the younger demographic will have more attachment to. And so we're working on that. You can't do that work if you don't understand the economy. So we focus very much on the economies, uh, both where we have been, where we are, but most importantly, where we're headed. And so that famous uh, Wayne Gretzky quote where um, he says, you know, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where it's going to be. So we're focused on where the economic puck will be, uh, not necessarily where it is today, but we do pay attention to where it is today. Uh, We do advocacy work. Um, So we have three lobbyists on staff 
Uh, we have two additional lobbyists at the state level, and then we have lobbyists that we work with at the federal level. And so we lobby at every level of government on behalf of business. We're unique in the fact that we don't take government money. So a lot of organizations uh, that do similar work to us, even partner organizations locally, they do advocacy, but they also take money from government. We've never wanted to be in that position where a governor or a mayor or a county exec could say, if you don't support my Y, I'll defund your X. And so we are pure in that sense that we we work for our members. And that's the last piece of our work is helping our membership, connecting our members to new ideas, new talent, new opportunities, new partners. And if you take the first letter of each of those words, so brand, economy, advocacy, and members, you get the word BEAM as an acronym. And so that's how we define our work is BEAM. And when you think about the word BEAM, one, it's a structure you can build upon. It's stable. It has you know, foundational structure to it. This organization is more than 120 years old. And so we are a foundation. We are an institution. And I'm working hard to make sure we'll be here for another 120 years. A BEAM is also a connector. Right? You use BEAMs to connect structures. And so we very much sit at the center of the network. And then finally, a beam is a projection of light. And so it goes back to that, who's telling the story of what we do, who we are, and maybe most importantly, who we aspire to be as a community. I love that. Okay. So I have to ask, what do people think of Madison from outside of Madison? I'm just personally curious about it. I mean, I have my like guesses. Well, so here's the interesting thing. So top line, so we did a, a national perception study. So a very large study using a company out of London called Brain Juicer, who used the state of the science to both ascertain what is top of mind, but even then what's below that and what do you feel versus what you think. So when we ask people, what do you think? First response is 70% of America has no top of mind impression of Madison. So first you would say, well, that's not great, but it's actually a blank canvas because <laughs> yeah. there are other places, I mean, Flint, Michigan, you know, and I think Flint's a great place, but it's got a brand now right. that it's got to work past. And there are plenty of San Francisco's developing a different brand than it had three years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be careful because brands can be positive and negative or impressions can be positive and negative. And so we've got a blank canvas to work on. But when we use the science to really drive down into their gut, because everyone's heard something about Madison. You've seen it on a TV show or you read something or you know somebody who knows somebody. You have some impression. We just have to pull it out of you. The, the, the majority of America uh, overwhelmingly sees us as the idealist archetype. And so there are 12 archetypes in branding. The in, idealist is Pleasantville, right? It's a great place. It's the place where you'd want to raise your family. It's sidewalks and white picket fences, it's, it's ideal. There are two challenges with, with that as a brand proposition. One, we've been selling it since 1948 when Madison was on the front cover of Life magazine with a, this beautiful woman and her beautiful baby that said, is Madison the best place to live in America? We've been selling that narrative for 75 years. The challenge with it is when you look at what Ann Arbor's brand is and what Des Moines brand is, what Lincoln, Nebraska's brand is, they're all the same. So it doesn't differentiate us mm -hmm. when it comes to being a Midwest second tier city. The other challenge is, is that what we found out is it doesn't resonate with people of color or with young people. They don't believe it, but they believe something different. And that is that this is a place of opportunity. This is a place where you can be part of something bigger than yourself. This is a place where uh, you can be curious. This is a place where you can make a life, make a career and make a difference. This is a place where experiences matter. And those are the seeker brand. So in order to position us mm -hmm. for the future and for the future of the workforce, which will be younger and less white as we move mm -hmm. uh, you know, forward in, in this economy, we are shifting Madison's uh, brand position, I would say, back to the seeker. Because if you go back 100 years, if you think of UW-Madison and that plaque and Bascom that says fearlessly sifting and winnowing, that's about as seekery as you can get from a yeah. language standpoint. And so it's not necessarily that we're changing Madison's brand from the idealist to the seeker, but we're actually taking us back to where we were, which is back to this place of being the seeker, the explorer, a place where you can be part of something bigger than yourself and do big things. 
Awesome. Well, it's good to hear that there's more depth out there than just like football, beer, cheese, everything like that. Those are part of the, I mean, that just a funny anecdote. The phrase that tested the worst across the country was Big Ten Athletics Town. And so we went to the people that did the survey in London and said, what? I don't understand. Like, what, what's wrong with Big Ten Athletics? And they said, well, we don't even know what Big Ten Athletics is. Oh. And we said, well, it's like a college sports conference. And they're like, oh, so it's like the Premier League in soccer. And we're like, yeah, okay, kind okay. of. And they said, <laughs> right. So people who aren't from that league don't mm. like people in that league. And so it was the people in the SEC and the Big 12 who decided they didn't like the Big Booing Ten. And so, <laughs> right. So, but we are athletics and recreation are certainly high on what people think of us as a place, which is fine. Well, thanks for entertaining my question on that. I was just curious. Okay. So as you run this organization, if you were to snapshot, I'm sure every day is different and probably every week is different, but what does your job entail as the leader of the organization? What, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting job. I'll say that. I don't, there's no other job like it in this region. And the fact that we are guided by a board of nearly 50 CEOs. So pretty much name any prominent company in Madison Mm -hmm. and their CEO or market leader is on our board, right? Mm -hmm. So we have an apex board, probably the apex board in Madison. There, there aren't too many other boards, if any, that rival the companies and the people that are on our board. And so on one hand, you are working with some of the smartest, most successful people in the region and helping them individually and organizationally do better, but you're also using them to help us be better, right? So it's a two-way uh, partnership. And then organizationally, externally, you know, sometimes we follow the business community, but more we lead the business community. And so it could be on any given day that we are pushing forward on things, again, looking to where the puck will be, that may not have any impact for a decade. Mm-hmm. We're, we're working on a complete virtual reality platform that allows people to talent who want to explore and experience Madison to immerse themselves in the virtual reality that's betting on virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality will be a much more prominent thing. I mean, it's growing already, but we're banking on 10 years from now that that will be you know, a form of communication that people are used to and committed to. So we're investing now for what might come in the future. We work a lot with government, right? And like, you know, kind of as a frenemy kind of role. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're friends when we need to be and we're yeah. advocates when we need to be. I, I think some of the, the exciting things about the job is that we get to peek around the bend and behind the curtain in ways that nobody else does, right? We get to see data that most people wouldn't have access to or have the capacity to digest it. We get politicians and government officials calling us and asking for advice or telling us they're going to do something that we're going to hate. And so we start to create strategies and tactics around responding to that. But it's quite a privilege to sit in a room with some of the smartest business minds in Madison and both hear from them and lead them when it comes to how do we take all of that work, all of that intelligence and wisdom and channel that coordinated action for collective good, which if you go back to the founding of this organization, that is what it's about. Mm -hmm. I mean, this organization exists because the business community realized that we are stronger together, right? That, That the strength of the collective gets better outcomes than trying to do it individually. So you touched on your now frenemy relationship with, with, the, with the government. And I was looking through your past work and you held political office and worked in the pub, private sector. And so I'm really curious about what your personal reflections are on the differences between those types of work. And how would you describe the difference between being a leader in both of these settings? I, you know, I think in government and in a lot of big organizations, but particularly in government, the bureaucracy is real. And there are times where the bureaucracy is probably advantageous, mm-hmm. right? So C.S. Lewis had this quote that we all want progress, but the first person to turn around when you're heading the wrong direction is the most progressive. You know, I, I, there are times where speed can create bad things, right? So the bureaucracy helps, but it also can be an impediment to getting good things accomplished. And so 
at in this organization, we we don't have bureaucracy, right? Even though we're an institution, it's one of the things that attracted me to this job. I came out of, as you noted, I had I did a limited service and actual inside government. I held the political office, but most of my career was spent in entrepreneurship and and so why would I want to come and run a hundred year old institution, particularly at a time when young people are at best skeptical of institutions and at worst hostile towards them. Right. So why would I want to come and run an institution? And I came because I was fascinated by the idea of what happens when you apply entrepreneurial thinking to something that's that old. Hmm. Like, does it, does it sit down? Does it break? Does it speed up? Does it do nothing? And so I came to this job with that single question in mind of, can you apply innovation and entrepreneurship to something that is so rooted and stable that it has no incentive to move or to change and what happens? And, you know, what I learned is, you know, there isn't a lot of bureaucracy, in, even in a century old institution. There's a lot of institutional knowledge. There's a lot of experience, but it actually can speed up. It can be nimble. It can move quickly. It can fail fast and fail forward and be okay with that which I would not have guessed when I first started Mm -hmm. out. And so that's not something you see in government, right? And so the difference between what I do today versus what I had done in the past feels a lot more like when I was an entrepreneur and small business owner than it ever felt like when I was in politics. But being in those roles has given me insight into behaviors and process and to understand and navigate the bureaucracy, which I think allows us to be a better organization and if you look around our office, we've got a lot of people that have spent time in politics and in government, even if they're not necessarily in advocacy roles, because at the root of this organization, we're looking for great communicators who are passionate about making a difference, who want to be to service to their community, but also understand that you know politics is the art of possible. And that's our job. Every day we get up and go to work and focus on the art of the possible with some hope and some curiosity to what makes us scared might be the next best thing that we tackle. I'm curious, you mentioned that your singular question when you started this job, it's really very entrepreneurial, like you really probably channeled that part of you. And I'm just curious about you as you've switched between opening your companies back in Laundry 101. I, I recognized that name. I was like, oh, I, went, I, I was in Madison <laughs> way back then too. And so I was like, oh, awesome. But then you went into working in government. Where do you think that comes from, that sort of willingness? to? I mean, that's a big testing of waters to take on a job of this mm-hmm. magnitude. Is that something, that risk-taking, something that you learned along the way that you developed was just inherent in you? I actually start with the word that you started this whole your your question with, which was you said I'm curious, and I think that's probably the root of me. Mm. I'm just curious. My first job was as a car mechanic apprentice, mm. and I became a car mechanic. So, you know, time I was 16, I was rebuilding cars, but I wanted the job because I was just fascinated by what made cars run. Right? Like, what is it behind the scenes that um, that you can't see? What can you take apart and rebuild? What can you take apart and rebuild better? What can you build new? And so I'm just a very curious person, but not destructively curious. I, I was when I was a kid. I took everything <laughs> apart and didn't put okay. it back together. I am much more of a, if I take it apart, I will put it back together and I promise I'll put it back together. And But I, was, I will say there is some risk. I don't love risk for the sake of risk, right? I I just filled out a new life insurance policy recently and Mm -hmm. it asked me like, do you skydive? Do you, Uh. you know, cliff (laughs) jump and like, you know, and I don't do any of those things. So I'm not, I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I'm not just chasing risk for the sake of risk, but I'm also not afraid of it. And in fact, after I was hired, I had to come in and give a speech to the board. And so here, here are, you know, 40 some 50, big name CEO sitting in a room, all sort of staring at the end of the big, long boardroom table with me at the front. And the first thing I said was, we're going to fail. And you could hear like audible gasps of like, what, who did we just hire? Like, (laughs) what is he talking about? And I said, but we're going to fail fast and we're going to fail forward. And then somebody yelled, fail cheap. I said, all right, we'll fail. We'll try to fail cheap. But that I don't know how you learn if you don't fail, right? I don't know how you get better if you don't fail. And so 
at the root of it is not wanting to fail, not being energized by the thought that I might fail, Mm -hmm. uh, but not being afraid of if it happens that I won't know what to do next. So do you think that as you have sort of moved around, I mean, a lot of times you see a leader that just kind of moved up, but you moved up and around in different sectors and different types of jobs. But do you think that that sort of willingness to take not destructive risk, but that willingness to take risk is how you continue to grow into new positions of leadership. Even as a child, while you were curiously taking things apart, were you also naturally drawn to leadership? Did you have a whole crew of kids coming over to take apart the the things with you? That's a good question. To the first part of your question, careers aren't linear, Mm -hmm. right? Even in Japan, where they had the most linear career paths in history are even less linear today. In fact, Karin Hansen, who was the former head of design and innovation for Intuit and Facebook, who actually is a graduate of the Madison Public Schools. We brought her back to Madison to do a talk. And she talked about uh, careers being jungle gyms, that hmm. you might go left, you might go I right, you might, you know, might go up, you might, you might fall, right? But then yeah. you get back up and jump back to where you were. And so I do, I think that is right, that I look at my career as a bit of a jungle gym. You don't necessarily know which way you're going to go at any given moment, but you have a sense of what you're doing, right? You know why you're on the jungle gym. So you have a sense of purpose. You know, where did the leadership part come from? I, you know, I've been able to both lead and follow, which I think is part of the making of a good leader is the ability to follow too. So I wasn't always the the person who had to be at the helm, but I always did gravitate towards supporting the leader. I always moved up in sort of anything I was doing. I always got mm-hmm. better at what I was doing. I didn't remain complacent. And it did work out that more times than not, I did end up at the top spot. And so there there is clearly something... I guess, I guess the, you're sort of forcing me to think back to where that moment was, but there was a moment in high school. I always thought I'd be a professional skateboarder. That was like my big goal. Cool. <laughs> sometimes I do these talks where I go to like an eighth grade class and I will skateboard in. Instant points. And I'll say, what do you want to be now? And then I tell people, well, when I was 13, I thought I was going to be a professional skateboarder. So I was a little bit of a rebel, a little bit of a contrarian. And I was in a drama class. But I had been tasked with building the set for like the school play and the drama teacher, Marianne Costa, I was, you know, acting up and getting others to act up with me. So I was, you know, (laughs) we were being rowdy and funny and doing, I don't remember exactly what we were doing. We were probably throwing paint or something. And she said, see me after class. And I thought I was going to be in trouble. And she said, you have a, clearly have a natural ability to draw people and lead. I think you should become the pep rally MC. And I was like, I like, I'm not the school spirit guy. Like I'm not like the person that goes to every football game. I'm not the male cheerleader, but she convinced me to do it. And, you know, I did it for a couple of years. I was good at it. It was probably the genesis of my comfort in public speaking. I put me on any stage, anywhere in front of any room and, you know, I can do it. And so she saw something in me that I was probably to answer that question is I think she probably more so than many people although there've been a lot of people in my life that have directed me and get guided me and mentored me, but she pushed me towards saying, take that energy, that a little bit of unruliness <laughs> and use it for good and get a couple thousand students to scream at pep rallies and have fun. And so I did it. Well, when you were using the jungle gym metaphor, I was thinking about how it sort of becomes a jungle gym that as you play on it, it also builds you know, it like gets taller as you go and then you kind of look down and you're like, yeah, oh, wow, yeah, each of those steps led to the next. And you mentioned being the MC of the pep rally and I saw that you recently were the MC of a conference <laughs> yeah. or something. Of and, South by Southwest Pitch, yeah. which is the, the largest pitch competition for startups in the world, yeah. So that jungle gym grew. <laughs> that, that jungle yeah, gym definitely grew. a bigger stage. It went from, <laughs> you know, a couple thousand screaming teenagers to some of the most prominent startups in the world and some of the biggest investors in the world all in the same room. Yeah, that was fun at, at South by, I've been a, a coach there for years. So I coach startup companies. Cool. Um, and then I ended up being head coach for a couple of years. And then last year they called and said, do you want to be the MC? And I said, wait, I've spent all these years doing all the work and getting no credit. <laughs> And now I'm going to do no work and get all the credit. Sign <laughs> yeah. me up. So I just got, I, all I had to do was hand out humongous checks, like liter- both 
in dollar amount and in size. I just got to hand out big checks and get credit for managing the f- show flow. You take that win for sure. Yeah, I did. (laughs) That's great. Okay, so I have a a feeling that based on the way that you've described your personality and your work, I know where this answer is going to go. But all right, you have your organization. There are, like you said, over a thousand member organizations within your organization. And then I also saw on your website that some of these members have, you know, 10,000 plus employees. So that is an enormous web of needs and goals and people. And it's amazing when, you know, here's the idealist, like it all flows together and everybody's working to a common goal and all that, but (laughs) that I'm sure is a very small percentage of the pie. And so I'm curious as the leader, how do you navigate the different needs and goals of all of the members, but then you are a human, you have your own needs and goals and your team also has differing you know, goals and needs. And so I'm just curious, do you have any like mental strategies or rubrics that you use to sort through this web? Yeah. I start with, and I think this is hard, particularly for people who are curious or innovators or who are entrepreneurial, if that's your leadership mindset and every, you know, so people should know who they are, but we have a tendency to look forward, not back. And I have really trained myself to make sure that I always look backwards. And the, actually, I told you the first thing I said at my first speech to the board. The last thing I said is the Chinese have this proverb that says, when you drink the water, remember who dug the well. Hmm. And I think a lot of times we think about innovation as just moving forward. But I have tried to become a student of history particularly in the spaces that I'm working in. And so in this organization, one of the first things I did is went back and read all of the founding documents, which was hard because most of them burned in a fire in the, in the late 60s. But really to go back and understand why are we here? What is the purpose of this organization? And what I found in that is even though the documents were a century old, it was that the organization was about managing change. The whole purpose of it was change management. And so taking that understanding of who we were and who we aspire to be and utilizing that to find commonality among very different organizations. So, you know, we do have organizations that, you know, they had 10,000 people a few years ago. Now they have 14,000 people. And we have organizations that have one person, all right? And we have organizations that you know, pull an open sign every morning and their livelihood depends on foot traffic. And we have, you know, organizations that don't do any business in Madison, but they're based here, right? And their talent comes here. And so how do we find those common threads that that exist between us? And a lot of it is in business, we think about ROI. So we think a lot about return on investment, right? If I'm going to spend a dollar, I need to know I'm going to get that dollar back plus hopefully more which is, you know, the basics (laughs) premise of of business. And I've tried to change the equation to instead of ROI, ROC. And ROC is return on community. And so what we talk a lot about and what we push for is that common thread between all these disparate organizations in different sectors and in different places and say, can we all agree that if we make a difference in the community, if we make the community better, stronger, wealthier, that you will get an ROI from that. It's not direct, but there's an indirect return to you and our community. So in fact, the dollar you put in, you get double because you're getting a return on your community and ultimately getting a return on your investment. And again, it goes back to some of the original things that the founders of this organization said. Some of the founders of Madison said, you know, one of my favorite lines from one of the original documents was, the surest way to grow the business of a community is to first grow its humanity. And I think about that every day when I come to work is, you know, that's my job is to grow the community in a positive way to move the economy into a better place for more people and business will benefit from that. I love that. So if there are sort of voices that are not happy with the direction, do you kind of return them to that sort of founding principle that this is why we're here together? Is that how you lead those conversations? Yeah. There's nothing that makes me angrier. I mean, it's probably the right word is then when people drop their chamber membership. And it does have, we have, we have one of the lowest churns 
of members in the country. So we retain the vast majority of our members, but we do have people that leave. And, you know, the reasons to leave that are authentic is I can't, I truly can't afford it, right. which will work with you if you truly can't afford it. You know, I'm going out of business, which we hate to see. And, you know, chamber members go out of business a lot less than non-chamber members. And I think that's because you're involved in the community, you're mm-hmm. investing in the community, you're People see it. And so we rarely have companies that truly just go under, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. People leave the region. Like I just, I came to try to do business in Madison and it's just not working for me. So uh, I'm leaving the region. But the people who say there's sort of two things that kind of, I mean, not kind of, they get under my skin. And the, um, the first one is you'll do it regardless, right? Like whether I give you $300 mm-hmm. or not as a member, you're going to do the work, right? Because other people are paying you to do sure. it. And to them, I tell a story that I heard, I can't remember if it was Italy or Israel, but I was on a, a trip and I heard this story about there was this village and they had a bountiful crop of grapes. And the village leaders said, we well, you know what we should do if everyone in the community all had this bounty. So we should make our own wines for sale and for our families and for our own consumption. But we should, everybody should bring one carafe of that, of your, mm. of your home wine. And we should put it in a community vat. And everyone agreed that it sounds like a great idea. And so people made their wine and sort of one by one, they all came down to the town square or the center of the village and they had their vegetal covered carafe and they climbed up the ladder and they dumped the liquid into this huge vat. And on the given day, when the village leaders convened everybody into the center of town, they pulled the spigot and out came water because everybody thought I can just dilute it a little bit and it won't matter. And it did matter. And so, you know, if everybody took that attitude of, oh, I can just not do my part and dilute it a little bit, what will happen? And something different, maybe bad will happen. And then the other is the people who just fundamentally disagree with us on a policy position. And to them, I say, you know, it is coordinated action for collective good, right? And so, yes, you are part of a coordinated action. You are agreeing to set aside your own ideals and maybe interest in order to get something better that helps all of us. And some people you know, are still very self-centered and they, they have a hard time seeing it. And so those are probably the conversations that I most break up with people and say, okay, <laughs> if you can't see the bigger picture, if you can't, if you can only see myopically and you don't see the return on community, that's okay. Right. People can agree to disagree. I'm thankful it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, I definitely bring back those history lessons and try to channel them to a better place and to understand the work that we do. You know, my grandmother once said to me, if you meet somebody and you are 75% compatible and you have spark, marry them. Okay. And I would say the same thing about the chamber, <laughs> right? If you are majority compatible it. with our positions and there's spark in the work that we do, you should marry us. Okay. All right. That's a, that's a great pitch. I have to say a lot of my leadership background started because I was very involved in camps, summer camps growing up. Mm-hmm. And that was a big part of my childhood. It's a big part of my adulthood as one of my work projects is that I direct a summer camp. And I am sure that I heard that wine story at an overnight camp once, but without the wine, <laughs> with it, they must have changed the story or it's some that's other right. tale that it was some other, right. but yeah, that's, that's, that is a it's, great it's one. It's the horror of s'mores without marshmallows. Yeah. Right. Something like that. It was, right. it was right. I don't think, yeah, it was something like that. All right. So that makes total sense. And I love the way that you approach that. And yeah, sometimes you got to just part ways with someone that you don't see, you know, it happens. It does happen. <laughs> and you can't stay true to your own core values if you are going to bend for the extreme. 100%. So speaking of goals and plans, naturally your organization has a map of what's ahead, but I'm wondering if there's anything that you personally are really excited about right now in your work that's either coming mm-hmm. up or something that you'd love to tackle. Yeah, you know, I think there's a I mean, there's both organizationally and personal I think to that answer. On the organizational front, we have started some really innovative, unique projects that are going to take a few years to to come to fruition. I talked about the VR. We've got some data projects that we're working on that I think will be transformational long term. They are 
rooted in the idea of fall in love with the problem, right? A lot of times people just fall in love with their solutions and like, oh, I have this great idea. I'm going to go do it. And then they don't really know what problem they solve. And when I coach companies, I have five fundamental questions I ask every company. But the first one is what problem do you solve? And you better have an answer, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> there's no reason. I'm not going to ask you the second question if you can't answer the first question. And so falling in love with problems and then developing solutions and being nimble and be able to pivot and adapt in those moments where it doesn't go the way you expect it to because it never does. There's a lot of really interesting excuse the language, badass projects that we're dealing with <laughs> or that we're building here that I'm excited to see them come to fruition in the next couple of years. Yeah, on a personal level, my curiosity has taken me down a bit of a rabbit hole of trying to understand the balance of dissent and conformity when you are trying to lead a team. <laughs> and I have a theory that the balance is actually tipped a little bit more towards the rebel than you would think when it comes to productive and fast moving organizations that want to accomplish big things. And so I've been doing a lot of historical research and dives into examples where counter thinking actually created better results within the organization. So I'm not looking for the disruptors, right? I'm not looking for ex those stories are, you know, are pretty prevalent. You can find mm -hmm. the people who just questioned everything and did it differently. And I think those are fascinating stories and I'm, I love reading about them. But what I'm intrigued by is what about the person who's all in on the mission, right? They are true believers in the work, but they think slightly different. And then how do you capture that? And I, my theory is there's a bandwidth that you are above groupthink, but you are below rebellion right? mm -hmm. and you have to find a way as a leader to keep people in that airstream. And it's very easy for people to pop up and pop out. And if you're not careful totally. and popping up or out can be really damaging and risky. And so most leaders, you know, will probably have a little bit of aversion to it, but I am, I'm fascinated by the, the examples of where that has worked and turns out, you know, in history in government in the military in religion there are some really really great examples where true believers who pushed conventional wisdom not as a rebel but as a believer accomplished some pretty amazing things and so i'm, I'm spending some time with that i'm a whiskey collector and so i love spending time collecting whiskey what else on a, like I told you, I, I uh, grew up as a car mechanic. So I've always been a car person. I know just about everything about cars, how they run. If you came to me and said, you know, my car is making this noise, I'd probably first make you repeat the noise just so I could laugh. And just, you know, as you're like, as you know, I used to do that when I was, people would come in and say, my car's making this noise. And I'd say, what's the noise? And they'd go, vroom, bum, 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 vroom. And I, then I just start laughing and they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. I get it. But I just bought an EV. And so completely, I mean, I, you know, I understand the concept of four wheels rolls forward and rolls back, but I don't really know that much about what makes the motor run versus what makes an engine run. And so probably spending a lot of time nerding out on understanding how, how electric motors run versus gasoline engines. Well, I have to say, I'm very curious about where your curiosity about you were talking about the rebel and the conformer, like where, where you settle on that and what you do with that. So I'm subscribed to updates on whatever you do with your findings on that. Cause that's Great. really interesting to me as well. All right. I have a few wrap up questions that are a little more okay. rapid fire for us. If you Sounds could give good. yourself a message for your first day on the job with the wisdom and experience that you have now, what would message to Zach of 2012 be? <laughs> Boy, it's a great question. So I, I've been asked a lot. I've done a lot of interviews in my life. I've been, and I have been asked a lot of questions. I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. I'm going to process it in real time. Okay. You know, I think it is probably about hiring. I would say be slow to hire and fast to fire would be what I would have, what I, what I would tell past me is, you know, it's okay. Not everybody is the right person for the job and it doesn't make them a bad person. It doesn't make you a bad leader, but be a little faster to, to let people go who 
don't fit what you're trying to accomplish. Don't try to bring them along if they don't want to or can't. But be also be a little slower to hire and just just because somebody on the surface feels like they're the right person doesn't necessarily mean they actually have the makings of what you're looking for. And so I think that would be the piece of advice in real time processing that in real time. But I think that's great. All right. Personally, is there one tool or strategy that you use for staying organized and effective in your very busy life, like tech or paper? Yeah. As you know, as a, as a curious mind, right. So I have a, I have a lot that's in my head and a lot Mm -hmm. going on at any given time and day. And then my job actually exacerbates that, right? So you're just, you're juggling a lot of things. And so I, I am constantly in a state of trying to stay organized and keep all the balls in the air. Uh, internally, I have this idea that I try to use with uh, myself and my direct reports, which is called Tasked. And the idea of it is, is to help keep me focused and keep them focused. And so it's a form we have internally. There's only three boxes that in each category. So it keeps them focused on what do they actually need and what can I get accomplished in one week or two weeks. And the task stands for task for the T, which is something you need me to do. The A is for approve. So you need me to approve something for you. The S is for support. So you want me to support your work and you need me to do something in order to support you. The K is for no. So you need me to, you just want to inform me. You want me to know something. E is for edit. So you're asking me to edit something. And then D is you need me to delegate that to somebody else in the team. And so I, from a leadership standpoint, I feel like those are the things I can do for you, but then I only give three spaces. And so you have to prioritize. You can only give me three things. And that's built on a little bit of my grandfather who I never met but was passed along uh, through my mother used to say, you can only do two things well. And I've always tried to push that to say, I want to try to do three things well. And so keeping it to three has been uh, that limiting. I try a lot of other things. You know, I am constantly in a state of evolution of to-do apps and integrations into Outlook, reminders. You know, I, I, I try to come up with, you know, the newest and best thing, partly out of curiosity, but also because I have not found the perfect thing. Right. Awesome. That's great. So do they code their tasks that they're giving to you with one of those other letters? Is that the idea? Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. So I it comes that. through and they say, here's what I have in the T, you know, today, here's what I have in A today, here's what I have in S. And then... My dream version of this, if I were, if I could write code, is I would have all that transfer into an app that then reminds me of the stuff I need to do. But I haven't figured out the link to remind me to do those things, but I do record them okay. and keep track of them at least on, on well, not on paper anymore, but on my remarkable digital Yeah, books. okay. Well, I, I, we, this would take us on a totally other rabbit hole, but I, I, I think I have the app. <laughs> All right. oh, it's called Notion. Oh, I've played around with Notion a little bit. You know what? We should go to coffee and you should show me how to use it because I have used to be a big Evernote user. And I know you can transfer from Evernote to Notion, but I've been told by a few people that Notion is a solution. I played with it a little bit and just haven't seen it. But if, if you want to, I'll buy you coffee or lunch if you show me how to use it. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. I'm like a big Notion pusher because it's the first thing that takes all of my brain like rabbit holes and puts them into one place that actually like codes and organizes and reminds and connects to everything. And so I'm in for for becoming a notion pusher. All right. My last question for you is if you have a day totally off, completely off, you can accomplish nothing on any of your lists, no task, no nothing. What is one activity you do and one place you'd go to have something to eat? I love to travel. I travel a lot. You only have one day here, Zach. I know. <laughs> I would fly overnight to Paris. I would wake up on the plane. I would grab a cappuccino and I would have a breakfast looking out some avenue, some street that just, and people watch and then get back on the night flight and come back. 
Well, that is an outside the box answer. That sounds great. All right. Well, Zach, thank you so much for joining me today. If people want to find out more about you or connect with you or join the chamber, where can they find that information? Sure. If you're interested in the work we do at the chamber, you can go to madisonbiz.com. You can also follow us on social media, uh, same handle at, at madisonbiz. Uh, we've got a, a, a great LinkedIn presence. We'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. I'd say I'm a little guarded on my LinkedIn, but I'll say this to your listeners. If you put in your LinkedIn request that you heard about me on Jamie's podcast, I will connect with you and love to get to know the work you're doing. And if I can be helpful, I will. Awesome. Well, everybody should take him up on that invite. Thanks for, thanks for including that. And we will link everything in the show notes. Thank you again, Zach, for joining me. I really enjoyed talking with you and hearing about your work and your past and your leadership perspectives. And to all the listeners, thank you for joining us. And we will be back next time with another inspiring interview. Follow the Leaders is produced by Lit Path Studios and music is by Shane Ivers. You can hear more about this show and all the other podcasts at Lit Path Studios by going to www.litpathstudios.com.